Welcome to the Cloaked Hedgehog's YouTube channel. Today I'm going to talk about something a little bit different. We're going to talk about Sweden and uh, our legends and the creatures over here who live just outside our view. In the good old days, trolls, giants, sea monsters and gnomes were not fiction but creatures to be considered no matter what sort of life you led. Seafaring was dangerous, not only because of the risk of bad weather, there'd be monsters, everyone knew this. Every time you set sail, you ran the risk of the ship being pulled under by any of the many sea creatures lurking under the surface. Sea creatures such as the Kraken. For the stay-at-home housewife, several measures had to be taken to minimize the risk of getting on the bad side of the skrimt the Oknit, which are collective names for these beside beings. Hot water couldn't be thrown out outside after doing dishes unless due warning was given first. A scalded gnome was a bitter gnome who could cause all manner of problems. Keeping the gnomes and other Oknit happy was key to living a prosperous and peaceful life. Rewarding the house gnome with food Pieces of clothing and such would ensure his continued help and good graces. The trolls stayed near the mountains, forests, and sometimes wetlands, and they were not above kidnapping a human child or young woman. In cases where a bari tagen, literally means mountain taken, person returned, they would not be the same. They would suffer from melancholy and always long to return to the mountain. If they weren't constantly watched, they were likely to wander off into the woods, never to be seen by humans again. The giants were mountainous and seemed to have been the ancestors of all the Oknit. They were said to be able to hide by assuming the form of a part of the landscape, such as a rock or mountain, and they could stay in this disguise for centuries. How surprised we will be when Kebne Kaise, our tallest mountain, rises up, revealing it was a descendant of Ymir all this time. I've been trying to discern what the troll situation is like in Sweden today. And there does seem to be trolls, even today. First we have one that has been dubbed Quasi, which is short for Quasimodo, the hunchback of Notre Dame. The reason for this name is because the first witness to describe it said that that was what it reminded her of. The quasi can also be called the potato troll because it has a tendency to be somewhat um, potato-esque in stature. It's described as ranging from a bit over three foot up to close to six foot in height. It's dark in color with a large upper body mass, no neck. It's hunched over and short, with relatively skinny legs, which it moves very fast, making the creature run much faster than its bulky exterior would seem to permit. The quasi is described to be not only very fat, but also somewhat lumpy, kind of like a potato. This potato troll has been seen spying on pigs. It's also been stealing vegetables from a garden. One witness indicated that it might have attacked a young horse. The main witness of this type of troll has also seen glowing eyes from the edge of the forest on a few occasions. She perceived them to be yellow, while her mother saw them as red. Whether these creatures with the glowing eyes are the potato trolls or something else is unsure. Other witnesses, however, seem to indicate that the potato troll does have glowing eyes. Most peculiar thing of all about the potato troll is that they don't seem to leave any footprints at all. Another type of troll that people seem to be seeing these days makes even less sense. There are several sightings describing the same thing, so I must mention it. I've dubbed it the moose butt troll. The moose butt troll is described as approximately 4-5 or five feet in height and looks like the backside of a moose, or Eurasian elk if you want to get technical. As one of the witnesses put it, imagine a moose and chop off the back part 
make it black and cover it with fluffier, longer fur, and then have this back end run around. That's how it looked. Other witnesses corroborate this description and simplify it further by saying it looked like a hairy ball with legs. Unlike the potato troll, the moose butt troll seemed to have longer legs and take large strides. It seems to have a particular fondness for clear-cut logging areas, but has also been observed in the woods. A third type that, to me, kind of seems like the most interesting one, and you'll see why, is something that's been observed at a family farm in the eastern part of northernmost Sweden. This is a small community which has 62 inhabitants, and it's quite remote. And the neighbors of this witness, the closest one living one kilometer away, began to find that their cows had been let outside during the night, despite everything being bolted down properly in the evening. Another neighbor came by to ask if she had borrowed anything, since things like shovels and hoses and old milk containers had begun to go missing and never turning up again. About two weeks after the first reports of strange goings on, the witness awoke one night to the horses snorting in the stable. She looked out the window and noticed that the lights in the stable were on and that three of the four horses were outside in the paddock. She got dressed and rushed outside to see what was going on. By the time she got there, the light in the stable was out and all four horses were in the paddock. Beyond the paddock, she heard rustling in the gravel and looked up to see a creature, about six foot three tall, with incredibly long, thin but muscular legs, an oblong, hunched over body, long arms with long, thin hands, a head placed directly on the body and big ears high up on the head. The creature was a grayish brown color and looked dirty and veined. The torso seemed to be covered in fur, but not the arms or the legs. As the creature noticed the witness, it grunted, flapped its ears, and leaped forward. After that, it ran very fast away from the farm and into the woods. The witness was understandably shaken, but was distracted when she smelled smoke and turned to see flames coming from the hayloft. She called the fire department but before they arrived, the stable had burned to the ground. The cause of the fire was deemed to be an overheated wire. Was the creature trying to help, or was it the saboteur? About six months later, a neighbor, who had previously found his cows let out at night, had his barn burned down. Again, the cows had all been released, so all that was destroyed was the building and the things in it. The cause of this fire was deemed to be arson, and a worker on that farm was convicted. Who released the animals? In folklore, gnomes have always played the role of the animal caretaker, but gnomes are described as two to four feet tall, not six foot three. If you listen to the description of that creature, six foot three, long, thin, but muscular legs, Hunched over body, long arms, long thin hands, big ears high up on the head, grayish brown. Kind of makes me think of dogmen there. But I don't see why dogmen would go around messing with people's horses and cows and setting fires or saving animals from fires or anything like that. But who knows? The next legend is about the mountain king. These are stories and legends that, if they happen today, they will probably be included in the missing 411 books. You'll see what I mean. The mountain king was a natural spirit, an elemental who was said to dwell within the mountain, surrounded by his family and a court of trolls. He seemed to have a bad habit of stealing children when they happened upon his mountain. Young women were also a favorite of his, as he, as most natural spirits, was a highly erotic being. The taken were treated to foods and beverages, and if they ingested any of it, 
they were stuck in the mountain or underground. Often the people who had become taken were used as slaves, but it also happened that they formed romantic ties to the beings in the mountain. I found a couple of old cases. Both of them took place in the 17th century. Ribingshov was a mansion in the province of Östergötland. In the 1600s, the nobleman Axel von Schaar was living at the Ribingshov with his wife Brita and his daughter Anna Martha. On a beautiful summer's day, Anna Martha and her nanny went to the beach at Vassviken to play. After a while, Anna Martha noticed some pretty flowers growing on the meadow on the other side of the road. The nanny went to pick some flowers for her and returned shortly, only to find that Anna Martha had disappeared. In vain she looked for the child in all reasonable places nearby, then she returned to the mansion with a terrible news. Everyone in the village helped in the search, but no trace of the girl was found. A full year later, a stable boy went to collect horses by Vasviken. On a steep cliff on the eastern side of the mountain, he saw the girl sitting. Risking his life, he managed to climb up the cliff, put the child over his shoulder and carry her home to Dibingshof. Anna Martha hadn't grown at all in the year she was taken by the mountain. Her clothes were the same they had been at the time of the disappearance. They weren't even worn. All she could ever say about her experience was, the old man, the old man. Her parents were convinced that supernatural powers had been involved in the girl's disappearance. For this reason, they sought the help of the church to have her engaged to a human man at only four years of age, to free her from the power and influence of the trolls. Anna Martha later married Johan Prinsenskjöld. During her first childbirth in 1687, she was at her parents at Ribershov in a room with windows facing the Vasvik mountain. To everybody's amazement, she once cried, Look, here comes the old man to take me away again. But whether he actually did, the story doesn't say. The other story is from Helsingland, where I live, by the way. In August of 1694, a rumor was going around the village of V. The farmer, Olaf Eriksson's daughter Ingrid, had been mountain taken into the Longyard Mountain. According to the rumor, Ingrid had gone missing for three four days the previous year as well. The people said Ingrid had become increasingly withdrawn before that. When she was out herding the cows, she would no longer play on her birch bark horn. Like a dreamer, she went there, listening to the cow bells and the murmur of the forest. Instead of dancing or talking at nights after work, she would be wandering around the dark woods and always in the same direction, towards the Longyard Mountain. When she returned home that time, she told of how she had met the mountain king. He was sitting on a rock at the end of the bog, just by the foot of the mountain. The moonlight reflected in the crystal crown on his head. He was wearing a silvery cape and was holding a flaming golden harp. He smiled at her and played on his harp and everything became increasingly more beautiful. Wonderful smells of spring filled the air, and she was filled with incredible joy. The mountain king sang a song to her about eternal youth, superior beauty and enjoyment. He sang about gold and glitter and jewels, and all the wonderful things that would be given to a human woman if she entered his mountain hall. He raised his hand, the mountain opened up and she was welcomed by etheric flowing entities. When Ingrid's parents returned home after mass some days later, they found her sitting on the front porch. She was pale and worn down, 
and told them that she had been inside the mountain where she had seen marvelous things. She said that even though they had offered her lots of food and drinks, she had managed to abstain, and therefore she had been able to hear the church bells ringing and walk out of the mountain. Ingrid continued her daily work, but was once again starting to feel down and weak a year after her return. Her concerned parents brought her to a wise old Finn in another village, and he used all kinds of measures to cure her, Christian and others. Ingrid felt better, but there was still something having power over her. One day she complained that she knew something was going to happen to her again, and that this time it would be for good. One morning she went out into the woods to collect twigs and such, and didn't return. Ingrid's parents sought the help of the old Finn and another old wise man living further away. They both said she was inside the mountain and that the basket she had brought with her to collect twigs would be found just at the foot of the mountain. This turned out to be correct. Many things were tried to release the girl from the mountain such as having a rooster crow at the mountain. Since the rooster symbolizes vigilance and alertness, the priest and the whole congregation gathered at the mountain, and with godly words and songs they tried to defeat the evil forces of the mountain. Alas, it was to no avail. Ingrid was taken and never returned home again. I'm going to finish today with a legend that comes from a place quite close to where I live. All the photos that you're going to see come from this area where I went last summer. There's also a very famous Swedish folk song about this event. It's called the Horga song and you're going to hear it in the background later. It's 18th century Sweden. The young men and women in the village of Horga in Helsingland have gathered for a barn dance on a Saturday night. It's June. The night is bright. The air is saturated with the scents of summer. Suddenly the music stops. The dancers look up and realize a stranger has entered the barn. He's clad in a large dark hat. From under the brim they catch sight of a pair of burning eyes. The newcomer picks up his violin and suggests a long dance, a Swedish dance type where the dancers hold hands and form a long line which follows the musician who leads it. Like a whirlwind, the dance goes through all the houses, in through doors, out through windows. Nobody was able to stop. A young man catches a glimpse of the stranger's foot. It's a hoof. The man grabs his knife and jabs it into a doorpost in an attempt to pull himself away from the long dance, but the door slammed shut so hard it tore his arm off. The dance continues, wilder all the time. The stranger leads them over hills and meadows, all the way up to the top of the Horga mountain, and seats himself in the top of a twisted old pine. The legend says that the dance continued until all the dancers were dead and their bones worn down so all that remained were the skulls jumping around until also they were gone. This is why the top of the mountain is smooth and flat like a dance floor today. The Horga legend ties into another one regarding necken or the neck in English. It is said that a person can be taught how to play the fiddle by the neck, and if they are, they will always draw big crowds to any place they play. The more they learn, the more successful they will be. But the final tune the neck teaches is a risky one. If you learn to play that one, no one will be able to stop dancing. The only way to break the spell is if someone realizes what's going on 
and runs up and cuts the strings of the violin. Well, there you go. Music and dancing can be dangerous business.